الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين. All praises due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. I've been asked to speak to you about the importance of learning of Arabic with regards to learning the deen. And <clears throat> my experience, my personal experience, has been exactly that. Because when I accepted Islam in Canada, the only available source of knowledge was the Jamaat Tabligh. So I joined the Jamaat Tabligh, traveled with them, I learned some basic Arabic reading, uh, Tajweed of Quran, but I found that their level of knowledge didn't go beyond that. What they were offering, their book, Fazaili Amal, right? This book, um, which they didn't want us to read anything beyond, they wanted us to continue to read this book over and over again. <clears throat> I found in it many stories which were very strange. You know, they, they, it was presented in a very attractive way, but I still found the stories strange. I remember one of the stories that were narrated in there, um, that they were talking about this particular saintly individual. They said, who prayed Salatul Fajr, with the wudu of Salatul Isha for 20 years. Right? And this was, this is how it was presented, like, you know, amazing. MashaAllah. But, what that meant is that he didn't sleep at night for 20 years. So what sounded amazing, yes, you know, he prayed Fajr with the wudu of Salatul Isha, meant he was up at night all in prayer. This was against the sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was not something commendable. It was not something we should strive for. And the book was filled with many other stories like this. You know, some of them taken from Ihya or Ulum al din you know, from Ghazali's uh, classic, which has a lot of good, but it also has some areas of you know, twisted, misunderstood, exaggerated acts of ibadah, etc. there. <clears throat> so I remember when I finished my stint with the Jamaat and we were in London preparing to go back to Canada, um, I, I, in going to some of the local mosques, I had passed this Islamic bookstore. So I stopped by the bookstore and I went and bought a whole stack of books on history and different subjects. And as I was coming into the, um, into the masjid, I was stopped by the secretary of the, um, <clears throat> the main person of the Jamaat, his name was Hazrat Ji. I was stopped and he was asking me, what are these books? So I said, they're, they're Islamic books which I got from the Islamic bookstore up the road. Apparently the Islamic bookstore, I didn't know this, was Jamaati Islami. Right? Jamaati Islami, that's another group from Pakistan you know, which is uh, similar to Ikhwan in Egypt, etc., who are very much focused on, um, you know, Islamic politics, you know, Islamic governance, ruling, establishing Sharia. This is their focus, right? So anyway, the point is, I mean, I got these books. This is books on the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, Islamic history, a variety of other subjects. But here was this uh, Sheikh, telling me, um, what are you doing? These books? I said, well, you know, I'm 
want to increase. He said, it's enough for you to read. Fazali Amal, you just keep. I said, I read it already twice. He said, no, no, you read more, you get more. You know? Uh, and um, I, I mean, for me, I felt this was something, something was wrong. Because somehow I felt to understand Islam, I had to get more information. That which, which was contained in those books were not, was not sufficient. So I felt something was wrong. And uh, <clears throat> when, when I told him, I also wanted to go and learn Arabic. Because I felt somehow that uh, to get to understand the Quran properly and the Hadith, etc. Because they, we were learning. These, these texts were there in Arabic. I could say the letters and the words, but I didn't know what they meant. I had to depend on translations, etc. So they told me, no, no. Um, I said, you know, I was thinking of, you know, going maybe to Mecca or Medina to try to study. I mean, said, no, 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 no need to go to Mecca and Medina. <laughs> I said, I said because the light of Islam has left Mecca and Medina, and it is now in Nizamabad in India, where Hazratji lives, and this light is so powerful that the Hindu kuffar will be walking down the street and when they come parallel to his house the light hits them and they just come walking in making shahada <laughs> I mean I, you know my, I, my background I was born in a Christian family raised as a Christian etc but when I was in university I became a communist right uh, so I rejected religion altogether and you know it's a scientific socialism and you're looking at things completely materially so once you hear miracles and these kind of things you know it just sets off red flag in your head you know there's something wrong here you know these stories so I couldn't really though others around me others who were with me in the Jamaat they accepted this oh mashallah I mean I was saying mm, doesn't sound quite right you know <clears throat> so um, I decided in my oh they told me he went there to tell me, if you want to learn the Arabic, you just go on a Jamaat with Arabs, you know, four month stint, you go, four months, you will learn Arabic. Because, they told me this to another story, they like to tell stories. They told me this story, there's one brother who wanted to learn Arabic, just like you. He went with a, an Arabic Jamaat, that Arabic Jamaat, he traveled all across <coughs> India with them, up north, south, east, west, all over the country. When, the four, when they reached the end of the fourth month, which is their, their um, period, right? They have things, you have uh, three days and 40 days, four months, you have different periods that you go out for, right? So they said when he reached the end of the 40 days, the, the, the four months, he was speaking Arabic, understanding Arabic just like that. And he had sat with them, he didn't take any classes. He just sat. They would be talking because they're Arabs. They're talking amongst themselves, Arabic. He was just sitting there. First, he didn't understand anything. But eventually, the understanding came. And at the end of the fourth month, he could speak, read, write Arabic. So I said, that's all you have to do. But again, for me, you know, these miraculous, you know, type ways of learning I said it didn't make sense to me really you know I knew you had to put some effort in there it's not gonna happen just like that magic right almost so alhamdulillah after I went back to Toronto and um, I realized also that during the course of my study of Islamic uh, law because in the UK <clears throat> They had a number of masters, and then they had about 50 masters in the UK at that time. And they had told me, because I'd wanted to seek knowledge when I went with them, that in every masjid, there is a Maulana who has graduated from Maulana school, and he is a scholar who you can learn, study under. I said, wow, so many scholars. So, it's wonderful. When I went there, Every masjid we went to, I had my notebook, I would sit, and there was no class, but I would just ask questions. And I would write the, my question, their answers, and so on and so, making these notes. And um, <clears throat> the person who I initially traveled with in Canada before I went there, I had made notes from what he was telling me also. 
on one occasion I remember hearing him oh he had come by when I was sitting with one of the Maulanas getting information and he heard me I guess ask a question which I'd asked him previously <clears throat> so he took me aside afterwards and he said listen these Maulanas have only just now graduated from Maulana school so you can't rely you know like 100% on what they're giving you right basically He's just telling me that whatever I told you, you should follow. You know, ignore. If they tell you anything which contradicts what I told you, then just ignore it because they're new students, new graduates. And he gave me the example. He said, most of them don't even know the way to wipe your behind in summer and winter. There's a different way. <laughs> okay. I just heard that was a reference he gave me. I didn't find out exactly what that meant until I visited Darul Arqam in Singapore. Right? Well, this is this is a converts association. They had a book there for new Muslims. And in that book, it was which was translated probably from Urdu, in that book they had you know various issues and things and when in the area on wudu in the area of wudu sure enough they had with a diagram the way to wipe your behind in winter and in summer right they explained that in the winter you should do it in a counterclockwise direction and in the summer you do it in a clockwise direction uh, yes you know amazing <laughs> Anyway, the, um, the studies that I had gotten there uh, when I was in the UK, and uh, they taught me at the same time that there is a special uh, way that women had to pray, right? I don't know, there's a kind of a buzz. What's that from? Okay. Hmm. They they taught that you know women in their prayer they pray differently from men it's a completely different prayer they had a prayer book for women and a prayer book for men right do you see them they're printed in turkey also the same thing men's prayer women's prayer you know in malaysia they have it also because this is mainly hanafi mainly it's the hanafi school that teaches this and of course when I was learning with my mentor, you know, he was t t telling me that <clears throat> you must follow, there are four madhabs, and you must follow one. Everybody must follow one. If you don't follow one, then it means your imam is shaitan. <laughs> you know? So you must follow one of these, right? So then, so I said, okay, which one should I follow? He said, well, you know, Abu Hanifa, he is Imami Azam, that's what they call him, the greatest Imam. He was the earliest, most, the, the firstborn of the four Imams. And most Muslims are Hanafis. Okay, I guess that means I should become a Hanafi. <laughs> so I learned the Hanafi prayer because I had to go back and teach my wife how to pray like a Hanafi. So I had to learn this prayer. Very acrobatic, you know? <laughs> Very acrobatic. If you haven't done this thing before, you know, you'll find yourself flopping and falling and, you know, off balance and everything. Very, very acrobatic. Anyway, point is, after I got back from that journey, I joined uh, a, a, another masjid. I went to a, a different masjid from where I was living before. I went to live beside the masjid. And the... Imam of the masjid was from Egypt. So I continued my studies with him. And I noticed differences. Well, the difference, one of the obvious differences I saw was when I was studying with the Maulanas, I was just asking questions, they were giving me answers. Whereas he had an actual book he was following. Actually, it was Fiqh Sunnah. I didn't know it at the time, but it's called Fiqh Sunnah, a well known book of Shafi'i Fiqh, which is it's not really Shafi'i Fiqh, it's a mixture. You know, it's giving the evidences from all the different 
uh, schools. But the author was a Shafi'i fiqh scholar. Right? Anyway, the point is that the evidences were there and the study was in an organized fashion. So I, I could see this seemed to me to be better. You know? But I found contradictions. Then I befriended, this is all within the first year of my Islam. I'm going through all of this. Right? Uh, I befriended a, a Moroccan. You know? We became very good friends and I hung out with him and his Moroccan friends. And I noticed, you know, they were praying differently. So here comes another difference. I said, well, what is this now? Right? They, they didn't really have evidences to tell me, but they just said, that's how we do it in Morocco. You know, we pray with our hands by the side. When the time comes at the end of the prayer to give taslims, we just say, Assalamu alaikum. That's it. You know? So, at, to, at that point now, I started to question. Uh, this is where I felt now it is definite for me to learn Islam properly I had to leave this place right I had to go back to the sources where Islam was born where it developed you know and learn Arabic at the same time I tried to learn some Arabic there using Arabic English books textbooks so I'd gotten some idea of a little bit of Arabic grammar but I felt it's time I needed to go overseas and study this thing seriously right it was not sufficient for me just to do what other people were doing uh, there were other people who were with me who accepted Islam and that's what they did they, you know they whoever they hung out with if they're with the the Moroccans they were Maliki if they're with the Egyptians they were Shafi'i if they were with the, the Pakistanis and Indians they were Hanafi that's just they just took it. That's we. As long as you're following one, no problem. But it, it stuck in my mind, you know, when when they told me that <clears throat> in the Hanafi from my uh, writings and lessons that in the Hanafi school, if you accidentally a man or a woman touched each other, right, that in the Hanafi school wudu is not broken. Whereas I learned from the Imam, Shafi Imam, that if you touched a woman accidentally, wudu is broken. So now that to me presented a problem. Because if both of them are right, then it means it is possible for you to have wudu and not have wudu at the same time. <laughs> and this was just something to me, it's you have to turn your brain off. You know, it's like the, the Christians with one plus one plus one equals one, right? You have to turn your brain off. This is not something that you can understand. It's just something you blindly accept. So for me, that these were all the things that were just gathering up in my mind, telling me you have to go and learn Arabic. Alhamdulillah. Um, after I basically resolved to go and do that it was announced in the masjid in Toronto that there were some scholarships available to go to Medina study. Alhamdulillah it's just Allah's will he provided it right at that point. So myself and another brother Dr. Abdullah Hakim Quick we both took the scholarships people who sat with us you know who told us from from Islamic Society of North America, ISNA and MSA and that. They said, brother, don't go there. You know, you're going to waste your time. They study from these old books, you know, which are yellow pages and covered in dust and, you know, you're not going to come back with useful knowledge. What are you going to do with it, you know? So they advised me, don't go. You get both of us, don't go. No need, it's just a waste of time. Ancient stuff, knowledge, ancient. But we had made that decision and we went. Alhamdulillah, we, when we got there, of course, we first had to learn Arabic. We went into the Mahad and began to learn Arabic. And of course, the methods of teaching Arabic were quite primitive. They were not linguistically developed. It was basically 
what they call the immersion method. If you hear enough Arabic, it's almost like going with the Jamaat, but it's, it's a little more organized, right? You hear enough, and they're teaching you actually how to use a dictionary, and so there's some structure there, right? You're not just sitting and people are talking Arabic around you, so there's actual structure. But basically, they're re we're relying on you just being exposed to large amounts of Arabic, you know, you're having to be you're in an environment where you must use it. Because the whole society is speaking Arabic. If you don't speak Arabic, you can't survive there. So it was like pressure on you to learn the language. So that was the motivation. We had one brother, I remember, from China who was studying with us. You know, at least we had Arabic-English dictionary. Hans Weir, Arabic-English dictionary. He had no Arabic-Chinese dictionary. Yeah? He had Arabic-English, English-Chinese. So he had to work with two dictionaries to get his understanding. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. But these are the challenges that we were faced with. But Alhamdulillah, after two years, though two years with this system really didn't prepare us properly for college studies. You know, college studies now where the teacher is talking completely in Arabic and then what you find out is that the Arabic that you learned <coughs> is like Shakespeare to them, right? You know, if I said to you, where forth goest thou, right? Which is really, where are you going? Hmm? Where are you going in Shakespearean English is, where forth goest thou? You see how weird that sounds to your ear? Well, then the Arabic we were learning sounded just as weird to the ear of the average Arab. Nobody spoke like that. Okay, it came in the khutbahs on Juma, you know, uh, official lectures being given, yes, it was used, but in the normal speech, they had slang. And the teachers, though they were supposed to teach us in Fusha, which is the classical Arabic, they mostly taught in slang. Even our Arabic teacher, PhD, you know, he would start the class in Fusha, but in about 15 minutes, 10 minutes, boom, he's back into slang, Egyptian slang, because most of our teachers were Egyptians. So this was another challenge. But alhamdulillah, I mean, we worked out other means. Uh, I made friends with some students from other countries. They wanted to learn English. I wanted to learn Arabic, so they gave me extra time you know, outside of the classroom to build my Arabic. I had to rely on a number of different methods. I went and bought children's books and started, you know, practicing to, to translate from these children's books to make, to understand, be able to read and understand children's books. And, uh, you know, even the, in the writing of books for, for children, um, although it might seem very strange, uh, we had to use dictionaries because the way they write books for children it's, it's very complex. It's not based on principles of educational principles where you're using certain language, certain words, etc. for the smaller kids. You build up vocabulary as you go. They will drop words in there and verbs in there from grade one that you ah, have to go to the dictionary to figure out what the child, children's book, a grade one children's book had meant. You know? So there were no end of challenges. But eventually, alhamdulillah, you know, studying the four years in Medina after the two years of Arabic. Then uh, we studied Arabic grammar in depth during those four years. Classes all in Arabic, environment all in Arabic. Alhamdulillah, by the time we graduated, we had mastered basic Arabic. We had mastered the basics. And for me, of course, I could feel the difference in Taraweeh, you know, having made Taraweeh in the early days when I first accepted Islam, where you didn't understand anything, you could hear the Quran, and then where you could hear the Quran and understand what the Imam is actually saying, what Allah is actually saying, you know. Um, being able to pick up the Quran in Arabic and read it and hear Allah's words directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
without an intermediary because no matter what translation you get the translation will give you only a part of the meaning because that's the nature of languages when you translate from one language to another some people think it's just special for Arabic no for in any language when you translate from one to another there are subtle uh, sides of the language which can't be translated maybe you need a whole sentence to get one word you know so the translations are always somehow deficient they give you something they give you the basic understanding the basic meaning but the the the, the deeper aspects you know you maybe have to use more than one translation to get different ways in which translators have approached it to get a, a, a wider understanding <clears throat> so uh, there's no doubt that learning of Arabic in terms of understanding the word of Allah the word of Allah being specially emphasized in this month the month of Ramadan where this is the month in which the Quran was revealed Allah gave it a special status simply because of the fact that the Quran was revealed in this month Shahr Ramadan الذي أنزل فيه القرآن so this connection which we translate as reading as much of the Quran as we can trying to finish the Quran in Ramadan it has become the norm in the Muslim world in the non-Arabic Muslim world to parrot the Quran where we don't understand a simple a single word that is there but we feel we have done what was required of us with regards to the Quran but in fact this follows falls under the heading of Hajjul Quran which is abandonment of Quran where Allah speaks in the Quran about <coughs> those who would abandon it this is a form of abandonment though this is not your intention or not our intention to do so but in fact in practice that is what we're doing because we're reading a text whose meaning we don't understand and the purpose of reading the text meaning of any text is to understand is to understand what is there to be able to benefit from it I mean this is why Allah revealed the Quran that his word would be read and understood would be recited and heard and understood so so much of the world the Muslim world loses out from that understanding from the source that they end up depending on others intermediaries between themselves and the Quran where you even had in some communities where the ulama the maulanas they forbade the communities from reading the translation and you'll be misguided you'll be misguided don't read the translation you just read the Arabic I will tell you what it means what you need to know I will tell you if you read the Quran by yourself for sure shaitan will misguide you this is how it was presented so of course this was in a way for many it was a means of monopolizing the Quran so you would always have to go to them to understand the word of Allah and of course when you have to go to them then there are financial benefits so it becomes a uh, a part of economics now you know that you have to go to the Maulana you know you have to drop something in the box whatever you this was a means of maintaining people's dependence on themselves you know. so uh, at this point in time of course where you are in the middle of Ramadan and you don't know Arabic what do you do 
you can't learn Arabic in a day. <laughs> Though some people offer courses, they say 24 hours, will you learn Arabic in 24 hours. But of course, when, they, when you actually look into it, it's not, it doesn't mean like you come one day, the next day you have the Quran. But you know, if you take one hour a week or two hours a week, you add it up over 24 hours, makes you, takes you maybe about six months, okay, you will learn Arabic. But it sounds very attractive, 24 hours, learn Arabic. The point is that, what do you do? You should at least read the translation of everything you read in the Arabic. <coughs> That is the minimum, that you read the translation of everything that you read in Arabic. And wherever I go, I always encourage people, you know, when they have the gatherings and presentations, they'll have somebody read the Quran, which Allah knows best, it might be a bid'ah. It might be. But it's commonplace, everybody's accepted it. You read some Quran before you start. But again, they read in Arabic and no translation. So I always tell them, please, you read the Arabic, read the translation so the people will know what Allah said. Not that they will see how beautiful that man's voice is, you know. <laughs> Very nice Qadi, you know. Because that's what you, it's just now an issue of music. You know, oh, I don't like him. Why? His voice, you know, it's not nice, rough. You know? So this is not the basis, the Quran, we should love the Quran you know, feel attracted to the Qur'an because of what Allah is saying. Not because of the way that the one who recited the verses recited it. So we don't have, you know, top of the pops, you know, the Al-Mishari and, you know, Farsi and this one. Oh, did you hear Hussein? This one, that one, you know. We don't need that. It should be about understanding the message. So reading the translation is essential. To go one step further is even better. That is reading the tafsir. So not only do you read the translation, because I know that at least maybe about 30% or 40% of that translation, you're reading it and you don't really know what is being said. You understand the English words, there is a meaning, but really what it's talking about, you're not certain. So, you can carry on, and maybe next time around you can catch it, or outside of Ramadan you can make a note and do it. You know, go back and look at the tafsir, get that understanding. That's one approach. Or, you can work with the tafsir right from the beginning. So what you read of the Quran, you read the tafsir of it. So of course that means what? If you just read the Arabic and read the English, maybe you will only finish Baqarah. Now if you're only reading the, the Arabic and the tafsir, maybe you'll only finish the first Jews. That's all. And of course you feel shamed. You know, I only did the first. How much did you read? I, I finished the Quran twice. And you're saying, oh, I only got through the first Jews. You feel shy. But believe that you reading that first Jews with tafsir is superior to finishing the Quran ten times in Arabic. Believe that that is the fact. If you are reading that with tafsir sincerely, that is ten times greater. Or a hundred times. Allah knows best. I can't really put numbers on it. I'm just throwing something out, but for sure, this is better for our deen. It's to understand what Allah is telling us. And ultimately, we still say, read the Arabic. Why? Because you should learn the Quran in Arabic. So that you don't need to rely on the translation. Because though you can sit in your home or in the masjid, Read the Arabic, read the translation. When you end up in Salah, you're stuck. Taraweeh, you're stuck. So there are circum circumstances in your prayers where you pray in Jama'ah, others are re reading, etc. You will not understand. So this is something that we should strive. We have the, the means now in our times 
on a, on a greater scale, we should strive to learn Arabic. You know, a lot can be done. It can be done online. At my university, Islamic Online University, we have courses. We have a two-year course which goes through all of the various levels of Arabic, basic Arabic, that inshallah by the end of it, if you do that course regularly, by the end, you should have enough Arabic to understand at least 75% of the Quran. There are other courses that have been developed, you know, where um, they're based on <clears throat> frequency of usage. So what they do in teaching the Quran, they choose the words which are most frequently used in the Quran. And they make that the, the beginning. That's where you begin from. The most commonly used words in the Quran. You start from there. So without learning grammar, they expose you to the word and the form. You're able to read the text. It's enough that you see the word, you see its meaning. And you study the Quran word for word translation. That's what they work with along with it. A word for word translation of the Quran. And that going through that, you will get also a, uh, an understanding. It will build up your understanding and it will take you to a point where much of what you hear you will understand. But it will be a general understanding, slightly different from when you actually study the grammar, where you understand to the point where the, the, a, a deeper level of understanding is there, where you can actually even uh, recognize certain things yourself, uh, because if you haven't learned you know how adjectives and adverbs are are derived from verbs nouns etc you haven't learned that process it means each time you see the word you have to memorize the word but if you understood the principle once you've understood the principle then wherever you see it in whatever form you'll be able to figure it out you know? but whichever way you know is available to you you know we should use our time uh, in Ramadan, outside of Ramadan, use our time to further our understanding of Arabic in order to further understand the Quran and the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that was the message which was chosen at the last minute. <laughs> I wasn't, uh, it wasn't planned on the spot, Just inshallah, hopefully, if you have any questions, you know, first, that you'd like to ask on what I spoke on. How to enroll into, to, into your university and what are the rates for the diploma? Oh, of course, the f we have a free diploma, which is literally free. Doesn't cost you one ringgit, you know. You can go and study. We have courses there in Arabic and Islamic studies courses, uh, about 40 courses there. Yeah, yeah. It's online. You just go online, you know, iou.edu.gm. IOU, Islamic Online University, dot edu, IOU. Yeah, I think it's not that sensitive. IOU dot edu dot gm. Sir, mm. sir, sir. Mm -hmm. Beside the translation, beside the tafsir, tafsir, mm -hmm. and frequency of usage, as a technique. Word to word. That's a word for word. Mm. Word for word reading. That's the third one, huh? Word for word. Yeah, yeah. So when you learn that time, what, how old are you? Because sometimes you are in old age. I was in my 20s. I was in my 20s, yeah. You know, um, the learning grammar, you know, it's learning grammar, learning the principles of the language. You know, if you have enough incentive, it's possible. It's possible. Expect how many months we are really... Well, we, we can't because different people learn at different rates. So it's difficult to put 
a time. But we've put it in a two-year course. We studied in Medina in a two-year program. But this will, again, still vary from person to person. Yeah, it's never too late. And, uh, you know, the thing is that uh, some people say, well, it's because of, of, you know, inclination towards languages some people learn. But actually, I had no inclination towards learning languages, you know. Though my father was a linguist, he knew about eight different languages. He had even learned Malay. He learned Malay in one month. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I had, my mom was a mathematics teacher. And so I got all the genes from her. I had no interest in languages at all. Mathematics, science was my field. So, uh, you know, I, even I had to learn French and Latin when I was in school in Canada, but I forgot it as soon as I learned it. <laughs> so I really had, it was really the drive to want to understand the Dean from its sources, which caused me then to learn Arabic. You know. Because even my dad was amazed, you know, how I learned. Further question? Well, you know, Allah doesn't burden anyone beyond their capacity. La yukallifu Allahu nafsan illa wusaha. So, this would not be a requirement in the religion if it were impossible. So, because of the fact that you may not have that kind of support, you may not be able to go as far as others, but still, you can get there. You can, working at it, con but you see, what it requires is consistency. You know, that you have to be consistent. Once you set a program for yourself, then you have to be continually following up that program, because what happens to many of us is that we, we are hyped up at one time, you know, we're like the match, right? You light the match, psh, and then tss, you know, you run out of steam. Yeah. After a month, you start missing classes, you get diverted, so many other things to do, life becomes busy, and then, you know. Because even when I was learning initially, you know, in Canada, we would have different Arabs who were teaching us, right, in Toronto. We had different Arab, but you know what would happen is that we'd have a teacher, he would teach us Alif Bata, and then we'd go on to basic basic readings, start to get some words, then he left. <coughs> Another one comes. Back to Alif Bata again. <laughs> so we did Alif Bata maybe I think about four or five times. <laughs> you know? So these are all hurdles, but the point is that you stay at it, it will come. Well, you ask Allah, you know. Allah may ni audu bika min al kassel, you know, min al min al kassel. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from laziness, al kassel. You know, you make that your regular dua. Allah may ni audu bika min al kassel. Well, in Medina, there's just Medina University. Yeah, there's just one university there. So. To enter, it's not easy. <laughs> Believe that there, you know, there's a hundred thousand applicants every year, and they only take about two thousand people. You know. And also, even Medina University, I think maybe up till now they haven't opened a women's side. No. So uh, for Arabic, I think, and uh, Arabic studies, they do have in Riyadh um, women's colleges where I think women are managed to get in. in uh, yeah, no, with your husband, it's possible in Mecca. If your husband's going to live in Mecca, you know, you have to have a mahram with you. So with that, it becomes possible. And there are other countries, I mean, if Egypt settles down, they have programs there which are quite intensive, which could give you Arabic very quickly. You can learn in a year's time 
what on your own would take you two years. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, the students who are studying online with my university, Islamic Online University, we have over 160,000 students. You know? This is, uh, these are those studying in the free diploma programs. You know, we have another 4,000 plus who are studying in the bachelor programs, Sharia, etc. But the free diploma, 160,000 from 223 different countries. And there are only 223 countries in the world. <laughs> So we have actually the record. This is we stand uh, as uh, you know Guinness Book of World Records that we have the most diverse student body of any university in the world, Muslim or non-Muslim. We do have uh, tutor tutors for the courses. Um, right now, the tutorial system is, is strong for the bachelor's program. If a person took that two-year Arabic intensive program, there would be regular tutors. In the case of the, of the free program, the tutoring is maybe once a, mo a month or once a week. It's not uh, less than once a week. You know, once every two weeks, something like this. You write in your problems. There are forums that you can, you know, request help, something like this. It's not as strong as the bachelor and uh, diploma, the um, uh, intensive Arabic course. We hope to, in the future, develop that diploma, free diploma side, also to have more regular um, help. But still, you can write in to the people of the course and get help, inshallah. Further questions? No? Inshallah, subhanakallahum wa bihamdika. Nashadu wa la ilaha la ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu alayka.